Thank you uh, very much for, for coming out, and I'd, uh, thank you to our, our uh, uh, sponsors for the evening, uh, Teva Neuroscience, uh, Genzyme, um, uh, Accorda Pharmaceuticals. Am I missing somebody? Malincrot. Malincrot. Thank you guys for allowing us to be here this, this evening. So if you, I, I see a lot of familiar faces. This is part three of our MS therapies uh, discussion. Uh, we did the, the oral therapies. Last month we did the injectable therapies. And tonight we're gonna talk about uh, some of the, the drugs that are given by intravenous infusion or IV. Next month, we're gonna uh, do what's on the horizon or future therapies. So hopefully you'll, you'll join us. Do we have a date for that? Okay. So. 20, oh, 20, August 24th, so same, same bat time, same bat channel, 6 p.m. here, August 24th. And I'm gonna see if my technology works here. And it does. So these are the currently available IV treatments for multiple sclerosis. Some of these are FDA approved, some of them are off label, and we're gonna go through these uh, in some detail. So there's Novantrone or Mitoxantrone, Tysabri, Natalizumab, Limtrata, Alamtuzumab, Rituximab, and Ocrelizumab. We're gonna talk about those two together. Pulse, Solumedrol, or Methylprednisolone, and then we'll finish up with Cytoxan or Cyclophosphamide. Are there any of these on there that, that uh, just raise your hand if, if, if you've heard of all of these treatments? So, everyone's, so are there some you've never heard of before? Okay. So we're going to start with mitoxantrone or novantrone. Novantrone was the first FDA-approved infusible therapy, and it wouldn't surprise me if, if some people here uh, or in the audience uh, on the Internet have not heard of this drug. And one of the reasons you may not have heard of it is uh, we don't use it very much anymore. Um, it is a chemotherapeutic drug that's been around for quite a while, but then when it was studied in multiple sclerosis, it was shown to be effective in both relapsing remitting and in secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. The way that we typically used this medication was given intravenously every three months. Um, sometimes we would use it in people who had very, very aggressive relapsing forms of MS, lots of active inflammation on the brain MRI, lots of active relapses. And in those people, we might give it monthly uh, for three months, maybe six months. One of the challenges with mitoxantrone is that there was a lifetime cap on how much you could get. And if you were giving it at the three month interval, it ended up being about two years worth of the medication, and then you didn't want to go any further. And the reason you didn't want to go any further was because there was risk of damaging the cardiac muscle. So it wasn't damaging the blood vessels to the heart. The drug can actually damage how hard your heart squeezes and can lead to congestive heart failure. And the risk of that congestive heart failure got higher after about two years use of the medication at, at the typical dosing. So the healthcare community, the MS world, was very aware of this cardiac risk. So we would do echocardiograms where we look at how hard your heart squeezes in people on this drug. In the original research, there was a mention that the drug could also cause leukemia. And it was felt to be about a one in 2,000 risk of leukemia. As time went on and the drug was used more, uh, more often, what we found, and it was really our counterparts in Europe who first started seeing this, it was discovered that that risk of leukemia was actually much, much higher than one in 2,000, maybe as high as one in 100. And it was a very aggressive form of leukemia, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, which is frequently fatal. We had two cases here at Shepherd Center. The thing that was so scary about this leukemia is that it wasn't related to how long you had been on the drug. You could get one dose of mitoxantrone and have risk of this leukemia. Um, so because of that leukemia risk, you don't see this drug used much in the United States anymore. Some European countries are still using it. Uh, they feel like the risk might be worth it, but very rare, rare to see it used in the United States now. Tysabri, natalizumab, this may be the IV treatment that most people are familiar with. Uh, it's a once monthly IV infusion of 300 milligrams. It's a type of drug called a monoclonal antibody. You'll notice that a lot of the medicines that on that original list, uh, natalizumab, ocrelizumab, rituximab, 
uh, alemtuzumab. The last three letters of all of these drugs is MAB. That stands for monoclonal antibody. Uh, there are lots of these drugs out there. They're uh, used in multiple sclerosis. There are some monoclonal antibodies that are used in other rheumatologic conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Some of them are used in certain cancers. What Tysabri does is it binds to white, some, certain white blood cells and it doesn't let them cross the blood-brain barrier to get into the central nervous system to cause inflammation in the first, pay, first place. It is probably one of our uh, most effective drugs for relapsing forms of MS. It's not uh, proven in primary progressive or secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Typically, we think of Tysabri in someone who's maybe been on one of our, our injectable therapies or an oral therapy and is either not tolerating the drug or their MS is breaking through in spite of that, that uh, baseline therapy, and we go to this now as, as our second line choice. It is, it is possible to use it as our first line choice. So if you have newly diagnosed MS and we think that the risk is worth it, some people go on Tysabri as their first line treatment. So why isn't Tysabri used in everybody everywhere with multiple sclerosis? Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML. Uh, PML is a brain infection caused by something called JC virus. Every now and then we have people get confused. There's, there's another neurological condition out there called Jakob Kreutzfeldt, which also starts with a J and a C, totally unrelated to JC virus. That's a bad uh, disease caused by a weird uh, thing called a prion. Uh, Jakob Kreutzfeldt is, uh, is a bad actor. People frequently or almost always die from that disease. JC in relation to PML stands for John Cunningham. That was the first human who was ever described to, to, to uh, uh, where they found the, the uh, virus. Normally, JC virus is a nothing kind of virus. There are a lot of viruses out there that basically use us as transportation. They use us to get from point A to point B, and they really don't cause any, any human illness. That's what JC virus normally does. JC virus uh, lives in, in the kidneys, maybe in the bone marrow. We think the way that it gets from one person to the next uh, is actually you, we pee it out so it gets out in urine. So 55% of adults in the United States and in most countries carry JC virus, and it's not a problem for them. So we, we probably pick it up in childhood. There's a lot of thought that if it gets out in urine, maybe we pick it up in places like public swimming pools. So if you're swimming in a public pool, do not drink the water, especially if you're in the kiddie pool. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you're not doing that anyway. Uh, PML, uh, happens when your immune system is compromised and there's something about that normally benign nothing virus that changes. It mutates and it becomes a very aggressive virus. It leaves the places where it normally lives in the human body, kidneys, bone marrow, and it goes to the brain. And PML is, is, can be very aggressive. As of June 2016, there have been 667 cases of PML uh, in people with multiple sclerosis on Tysabri. Uh, that's in the whole world. Of those 667 people, about 23% of them have died from it. 77% of people have varying degrees of disability. One of the areas of research is in those 77% of people who survive PML, why do they survive? What's different about their immune systems? Some of these people actually have almost no disability. It's like nothing ever happened to them. Some of those 77% of people are in nursing homes. It's like they've have, a, have had a devastating stroke. So there's a lot of research going on looking at the antibodies and people who do well with PML, trying to tap into that to see if, if could it be something that would lead us to a treatment uh, or a prevention or a vaccination for, for JC virus. So your risk of PML, if you're on Tysabri, is determined by really three things. The, the, whether you carry JC virus or not, because you have to have the virus to get the, the disease. The length of time you've been on Tysabri, and whether you've been on a prior immunosuppressant drug. So things like mitoxantron, cyclophosphamide, chemotherapeutic dr type drugs that suppress your immune system in the presence of, of, of the JC virus put people at a higher risk for developing uh, this brain infection. 
we've come a long ways in helping uh, people d determine whether they feel comfortable being on Tysabri or not. One of the most important things that's been developed is JC virus antibody testing. We now have the ability to, to determine whether an individual carries JC virus or not. Are you in that 55% of adults who do, or are you in the 45% of people who don't? The first generation blood test that we had simply said yes or no. You have antibodies to the virus or you don't. It didn't tell you how much antibody, it was just a yes or a no. What we're using now is second generation testing, which is actually much better because it actually gives us a numeric value called the JC virus antibody index. And what we can do with that number is we can put people into one of three groups. Either you're truly negative, you have a number of an index number of less than 0.2, you're low positive, meaning you're between 0.2 and 0.9, or you're high positive, uh, you're greater than 0.9. And we'll, well, I'll show you a chart in a minute that we use actually to show people and say, what is your risk if you were on Tysabri based upon those numbers? I'll add a point here that I didn't put in the slides, but. Doing the JC virus antibody index in a person on a drug like Tysabri is not something we do just one time. It is possible for a person who doesn't have JC virus to convert and develop one of these higher numbers and shift you from a low risk group to a higher risk group. The FDA recommends uh, rechecking the JC virus antibody index every six months for people on Tysabri. We like doing it every three months here just to be really obsessive and make sure those numbers aren't changing. So if we look at the whole group of everybody with multiple sclerosis who's on Tysabri, regardless of what their JC virus number is, regardless of whether they've had a prior chemotherapy, uh, regardless of, of uh, the length of time they're on treatment, the overall risk of PML with Tysabri use is 4.22 out of 1,000 people. When we start going through these numbers and talking about you know, numbers per thousand, one of the things I would really emphasize is that there's no absolute right or wrong. We can't go to an individual and say, you are the perfect candidate or you're the absolute worst candidate. It's all about your individual risk tolerance. I can give these same numbers to two very reasonable individuals with MS and one person could say, absolutely not. That risk is not okay for me. And someone else would say, I'm okay with that. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure people understand what the numbers mean and then help make them a, a decision that's comfortable for them. This, I think, is the most important table out there. This takes that 4.22 per thousand number and says, but there's a lot more information. We can give people much more specific guidance. Uh, this is from a researcher named Plavina uh, who published this uh, a couple of years ago. And what they did is looked at the JC virus antibody index number, which is on that far left column. So you can be less than 0.9, less than or equal to 0.9. You can be between 0.9 and 1.1, 1.1 .1 to 1.3, 1.3 to 1.5, or greater than uh, 1.5. And then on the, the top row, uh, we've got how long are you on treatment? This chart only applies to people who've never had a chemotherapeutic drug. So if you've been on a medicine like a chemotherapy, that's a, that's a different risk group. You are always gonna be in a higher risk group if you've had prior chemotherapy. But what you can see, and where the second generation test is so helpful, is that in that group of people that are, are technically positive, they've got a number of greater than 0.2, but they're less than 0.9. So they're, with the old test, we would have said, you've got JC virus uh, antibody in your system, you're in a higher risk group. What we know now is that there's a chunk of those people who have a positive test, that when you look at that 0.9 number, uh, or the, the, the 0.2 to 0.9, their risk is really no different from the people who have a negative number. So these are these uh, 0.1s and 0.3s, these are expressed in per thousand people. So if you have a, a JC virus antibody number of less than 0.9, you have a risk of 0.1 per thousand, or one out of 10,000 people on Tysabri for the first two years. As you go across to the next line, 25 to 48 months, your risk ticks up a little bit, three per 10,000. Then it goes up to four out of 10,000 and it stays there. So if, you, if you're in that next risk group, what if you're between 0.9 and 1.1, where your risk in the first two years is, is one out of 10,000, it goes to seven out of 10,000 and it stays there and so on. So your highest risk group is down in that bottom right-hand corner, 
uh, per thousand people. That equates to about one out of 120 people. That's if your number, if your JC virus number is greater than 1.5 and you've been on treatment for more than four years, your risk is up in the one out of 120 uh, people group. For me, if I was making that decision for myself or if I was talking to a family member, that's, that's pretty high to me. And I would, we encourage our people who here at Shepherd who are in that group, we're gonna start giving you a gentle nudge towards thinking about some other treatment. Do we have people who elect to stay on Tysabri even though they're, they're in that risk group? We do. These are typically people who've tried everything else out there and they feel really good on Tysabri and they feel like the risk is, is worth it. So again, there's no absolute right or wrong. You hear a lot of, of things in the, on the internet or read things saying that you can't use Tysabri for more than two years. That's not true. It, it's more than just the length of time. It's your JC virus antibody number and whether you've been on prior immuno, uh, immunosuppressants. We're gonna shift now to our next IV treatment, and that's Lemtrada or Alemtuzumab. This is another one of those MAB drugs. The, the fancy immunologic term is that this is an anti-CD52 monoclonal antibody. CD52 uh, receptors are present on the, the two major types of white blood cells in our body, T cells and B cells. So what this drug does is it knocks down the levels of both those types of cells. It is a very, very effective treatment for relapsing forms of MS, not so much for progressive forms of MS. Um, it's, it's given as a once a year IV dose. The way that this works is you get five days in a row, uh, year one, a year later you get three days in a row, and then it's kind of on an as needed basis. If your MS is and it's not acting up, you probably don't need to be retreated. So there's a lot of, of watching and waiting uh, after you receive this drug. The safety issues with Lemtrada are something that we need to think about. Lemtrada is not something that we would consider as a first line treatment. It may not even be a second line treatment because of the safety issues. This is something where you really need to have the risk uh, you know, uh, outweighed, or, um, outweighed by the benefits. Some of the side effects that we see with this drug are autoimmune uh, disorders, uh, things like low platelet counts or thrombocytopenia a kidney disease called anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, and then thyroid problems. The infusions themselves can be a little bit bumpy. There are pre-medications that we need to give uh, when we give this medication. Some people look like they're sort of having a, a, almost like an allergic type reaction when it's really a histamine reaction. They can get red, they feel a little short of breath, they can be itchy when, when they're getting their infusion. Um, there is an increased risk of certain cancers like melanoma, thyroid cancer, and lymphoma. Because of those risks, it is, the, the, it is incredibly important that people not drop off the map. There's safety monitoring that needs to be done meticulously with Lemtrada. We need to do blood testing, uh, blood count with differential, uh, looking at your kidney function, looking at, at your urine test. And that needs to be done very regularly and it needs to continue for four years after you receive your last dose of Lemtrada. Um, you need to get baseline and yearly skin exams because of the risk of, of skin cancers with this drug. So this is one, again, that where the, the, the effectiveness is very high, but the risk is also potentially significant and needs to, to, it's very important that we do regular safety monitoring with this drug. I lumped these two drugs together, rituximab and ocrelizumab. Um, because they're, they're sort of in the same family. These are both what we call anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. R the story with rituximab is that this is a drug that was originally, originally designed to treat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it's not really a chemotherapy. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is B cells in the immune system growing out of control. And so rather than using chemotherapy to treat that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, researchers found that, that during the lifespan of these B cells in the immune system, there's a point in their life cycle when they have a receptor on the surface called a CD20 receptor. It's almost like an on and off switch, if you, if you will. And so that they could very selectively go in and turn off these cells that were growing out of control in these lymphoma uh, patients and leave the rest of the immune system alone. 
Well, that caught the attention of neurologists and rheumatologists because we know that B cells play a role in multiple sclerosis. They play a role in the cousin of multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica or Devix disease. They play a role in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. So there was a research program looking at rituximab for multiple sclerosis. Researchers at the same time showed that rituximab is probably the most effective drug we have to treat neuromyelitis optica, this cousin of multiple sclerosis. None of our MS therapies have ever worked very well in neuromyelitis optica, and NMO can be very aggressive. People can die from it. So rituximab was, was really a blessing for, for those individuals. As the research was going along in rituxamab, for rituximab and multiple sclerosis, one of the things that the research group wanted to try to improve upon was the molecule itself. When you look at most of our MAB, MAG, uh, MAB drugs, you'll see that, that before the MAB, there's a ZU, natalizumab, Tysabri, LM2-zumab, Limtrada. Rituximab was the only one of our MAB drugs that didn't have a ZU in front of it and an XI in front of it. And what that XI means uh, is that it's chimeric. It's part mouse and mostly human. That part mouse part of the antibody is what the research group wanted to get rid of. Because in theory, if you have an antibody that is mostly human, but a little bit mouse, the human immune system could say, you know what? I don't like that mouse antibody. I'm gonna make antibodies to the antibody and make that drug less effective. So that was the concern with rituximab. So when the research group sort of uh, humanized that and cleaned it up, that's what ocrelizumab is. Once they changed that molecule, though, it set the research clock all over again. So we were pretty far along in the research with rituximab. When they changed the molecule, it started the clock over again. So ocrelizumab is the humanized uh, version of this, of this molecule. It's slated to be FDA approved on December 28th of this year. What's gonna be very interesting is it should be approved for both relapsing remitting MS, which is great news. It will be the first drug ever approved for primary progressive MS. So it should get approval for both of those forms of MS at the same time. If, so we have a lot of people on rituximab right now off-label. We use it, again, for neuromyelitis optica. We use it in certain situations with multiple sclerosis. If those individuals on rituximab, if we switched them over to ocrelizumab and didn't tell them, I would expect that they probably would never know the difference. They're both every six-month IV treatments. What's, what would go in the IV bag would obviously be different. And the dosing, the, the milligram dose is a little different. With rituximab, we typically use 1,000 milligrams. With the ocrelizumab, we're going to use 600 milligrams. Um, one of the drawbacks with these drugs is they are very slow infusions. They take about six hours to run in. So twice a year, someone's going to be hanging out here most of the day back in the IV room and chatting with the, the IV nurses and, and just hanging out for a bit. We don't know yet but it's very possible when ocrelizumab gets FDA approval, there may be a warning label about PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And the backstory for why there could be is that with rituximab, the very closely related drug, there have been 10 cases of PML, but they were very distinct. Of nine of those 10 cases were in the rheumatology world. For reasons we don't understand, some rheumatologic conditions like lupus, just the very nature of the disease itself, we see a higher risk of PML in those individuals, uh, even without treatment. When the rheumatologists use rituximab in rheumatologic conditions, they almost always put it with a chemotherapeutic agent, an Imuran, a methotrexate, something like that. So that, that double hit on the immune system may be what's putting these people at, at some risk, a small risk, but still it's there, of developing PML. There has been one case of PML in the, in the MS world. That was an individual who was on Tysabri who had, had high levels of JC virus antibody index and had been on the drug for quite a bit and was taken off for safety reasons, got rituximab, developed PML. That really is a Tysabri PML case, but because they had received a dose of rituximab, it's gonna, it has to get labeled as a rituximab risk. So there have been no cases of PML uh, with, uh, with ocrelizumab. We obviously will watch people closely and probably do some JC virus antibody index testing. In my book, and this is just me personally, I don't think the individual who has JC virus 
antibody levels that are high is excluded from being on ocrelizumab. We would still be comfortable. And in fact, we anticipate that maybe a group of people who are going to go on ocrelizumab fairly soon after it's approved are the individuals who are on Tysabri who do have high levels of JC virus and we're starting to get a little bit nervous and we're looking for another option. Shifting now to, to pulse solumedrol, so, or methylprednisolone. So normally when we think of, of IV steroids, solumedrol, methylprednisolone, we think of it for relapse management. So if you have an MS attack or relapse exacerbation, you get three days, five days in a row of, of IV steroids to treat that relapse. And that is the, the traditional way that we use solumedrol. There is uh, a, some place in the, in the toolbox for using pulse solumedrol as your baseline therapy. It's not done commonly. I would say it was more common a few years ago when, when we didn't have as many treatment options. Sometimes it was something that was added to a, a baseline treatment. For instance, if you were on Avonex, Copaxone, Beta Seron, and you were having some breakthrough MS activity, maybe we'd, we would add the pulse solumedrol to that. There are a lot of different recipes out there for how solumedrol can be given uh, in pulse therapy. Some people would do one day a month IV. Others would do what we call a 3-1-1 protocol, where you would do three days in a row, month one, one day, month two, one day, month three, and then start that cycle over again. Um, Steroids over the long term, we have to be aware of the, of the long term uh, risks of steroid usage. Uh, it can raise your blood pressure, can raise your blood sugar. Uh, you can see mood changes. Some people are very happy and energetic and motivated uh, and euphoric on steroids. Some people are evil and mean and their families want to move out when they're on steroids. Some people don't sleep at all. And you just never know in a given individual how they're going to respond. Uh, uh, potassium levels can drop, weight can go up, bone density can go down, so, the, so we have to be aware of some of these other things. One of the most uh, significant side effects that we sometimes see with steroid usage is called aseptic necrosis of the femoral head. So the, the, the ball of your femur, uh, where it sits in the hip joint, in some people, the blood supply is, is somehow affected by the steroid usage, so that bone gets very crumbly and brittle, and you can actually have that ball of the hip joint just pop off in, in people, and, which is obviously not a good thing to have happen. And then lastly, uh, premature cataracts are something that we see with, with steroids. I'm going to finish up before I turn it over to you guys for, for uh, questions with cyclophosphamide or cytoxan old school chemotherapeutic drug. It's used sometimes in the MS world, sometimes the, uh, the rheumatologists use this for things like lupus uh, and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, usually it's given as a once a month IV dose, somewhere between 500 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams. Um, some of the, the universities like Harvard um, do, it a, do things a little differently. They will do what they call induction therapy. So if you have aggressive newly diagnosed MS, they will use high, high doses of cyclophosphamide for a very short period of time to really get in and whack your immune system hard, kind of hit the reset button to get things restarted again. And then so the risk is a little bit higher uh, doing it that way, but the, uh, they are still uh, doing studies with that. When we think about cyclophosphamide or cytoxan safety, uh, can cause nausea. We usually uh, pre-medicate people with something for nausea. Hair thinning, unusual. We have to monitor your platelets. They can get low. You can have increased risk of uh, bruising or bleeding. Uh, anytime we alter the immune system significantly, there could be a risk of secondary cancers down the line. And then hemorrhagic cystitis, so this irritation of the lining of the bladder where you start having some bleeding into the bladder is, is, a, is a risk with cytoxin. We don't use a lot of this drug anymore. We have so many other options out there. You know, when we think about drugs that are like mitoxantrone or cyclophosphamide that are more chemotherapeutic, I always think of those as sort of more the sledgehammer approach. You know, rather than manipulating one small part of your immune system like you might with a monoclonal antibody, this is more just whacking, you're playing whack-a-mole with your immune system and kind of clubbing it into, into submission, which is not our favorite thing to do. Before I turn it over to q and I'll finish up. 
Uh, so this is, uh, uh, other than MS is a passion, this is something that, that our family's passionate about. I think we've, I've talked about this a little bit before. It's near and dear to our heart. We just got back from Nicaragua on uh, Sunday. So we do our twice uh, yearly medical trips uh, down there. Uh, the, on the top left is our 18 year old. He is, he is a gentle giant. The kids down there love him. So that's him torturing one of the small children down there. The, he's like a Pied Piper. He always has tons of, of the, the children from the village around. My wife's there in the middle, that's one of the houses we were going out to to do a home visit. Um, bottom left, this is um, not an unusual site in, in Nicaragua. This is a typical uh, house in the village there. Literally, think of the forts if you're a guy. Think of the forts that you used to build in the woods when you were a kid. You, know, you get some uh, plywood or some lumber and you steal a piece of metal from over here. That's what a lot of people live in down there. Dirt floors, no running water, no electricity. Um, one of the things that is amazing to me in, this, in, in the village is the 85% of the population is Catholic, and there is a little cat, small Catholic school in the village. The boys and girls wear uniforms, so white shirts, slacks for the boys, skirts for the girls. Perfectly pressed, perfectly clean. There's not a washer or dryer in this entire village of 2,000 people. Uh, everything is, is washboard or scrubbed on a stone and then hung out to dry, but you will never see a stain on any of these shirts. How, how they keep their, the, uh, their uniforms so clean is just mysterious to me. They're very proud about it. Um, the gentleman in the middle there uh, in the wheelchair, is, uh, is that's Armando. He is a 45-year-old uh, gentleman. Uh, who had a spinal cord tumor, so he's paraplegic. Um, this guy, so most of the people there, their income is from subsist, uh, subsistence farming, coffee beans, things like that. Uh, this guy who is, you know, uh, had a very, very difficult time, has put four of his five ch uh, children through college. Uh, just amazing, they're, they're very, mostly have gone into the veterinary field. His fifth child is in grade school right now, but will probably go to college like the, like the four siblings did. So just a real testament to how tough the uh, people can be. And then the two pictures of the, the geography, that's a volcanic crater lake up on the top and the dark is actually a lava field. And then on the bottom, corner, that is Messiah. That's one of the many, many, many volcanoes in, in uh, Nicaragua. That one is, is active and, and that's actually looking from the uh, window in the airport. It's, it's that close to the, to the airport. Yep. Thank you guys very much. I will let Casey wrap it up here and, and with some last thoughts. I appreciate you coming out. Be careful going home.